Hello, I'm Melissa Majors, Executive Director of Greater Columbus Community Shares, welcoming you to Focus on Community, the program where we highlight the work and activities of Community Shares member agencies. Our guest today is Kathy Levine of the Universal Healthcare Action Network of Ohio. This is one of Community Shares' new agencies in 1998. I'm looking forward to hearing about the work of You Can Ohio, and I hope you'll stay tuned for this edition of Focus on Community. Greater Columbus Community Shares raises money for grassroots nonprofits through workplace payroll deduction fundraising, builds bridges between employers, employees, and the nonprofit community, generates more funding to meet urgent human needs, and provides innovative solutions to social problems. Giving to Greater Columbus Community Shares is a sound investment in our community's future. Greater Columbus Community Shares is your choice in the workplace. Hello, this is Melissa Majors of Greater Columbus Community Shares. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Community. I'm going to be interviewing our special guest today, Kathy Levine of the Universal Healthcare Action Network. Kathy, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure, Melissa. Well, you are one of our newest agencies. You joined uh, as officially in 1998 as a member of Community Shares. So I'm not quite as familiar with your work as I am with some of our longer members. And I myself am really anxious to learn about some of the projects in which you're involved. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe a little background or history of You Can Ohio. Sure. In 1988 in Cleveland, an organization, a coalition was formed called the Northeast Ohio Coalition for Universal Health Care. And that was a coalition of religious, labor, and community organizations and individuals who were concerned about the growing numbers of uninsured people in Ohio mm -hmm. and the, health, the problems people had getting their health needs met. Last year, the Northeast Ohio Coalition decided it was time for us to become a statewide organization because we had been functioning as a statewide organization. I've been working for the organization for several years, working in Columbus on state issues. And because we had a statewide membership and we're dealing with issues that were of concern around the state, we decided to become a statewide organization. So in July of 1997, we became the Universal Health Care Action Network of Ohio. So your name more accurately reflects the work that you're doing around the state, and you've opened an office here in Columbus now. That's right. We opened our office in January of 1998 in Columbus. And what is your role with You Can Ohio? I'm the policy director. So I pay attention to uh, mostly to state policies and I oversee a project in Columbus um, that has pulled together a coalition called the Coalition for Community Health Care. The Coalition for Community Health Care. And their role related to these health care issues is? Well, the Coalition for Community Health Care actually got started last year when Doctors Hospital, a nonprofit hospital here in Columbus, um, entered negotiations to sell to the big for-profit giant Columbia HCA and many community organizations in the city were concerned about the potential negative impact that that sale might have on access to health care particularly for more vulnerable populations such as the poor, the working poor and the uninsured and disabled populations. So we raised concerns with the Board of Trustees of Doctors Hospital and and did educational presentations in the community about our concerns about that potential sale. And fortunately, Doctors Hospital withdrew from those negotiations. Now the coalition has decided to continue and to expand to address unmet health care needs in the community. And we are pulling together neighborhood associations, people who are advocates or consumers mm -hmm. from different neighborhoods around the city so that we could unite in one citywide coalition. It sounds like you have a pretty broad-based community support then or community involvement in this work. We do. We have labor organizations. We also have a lot of um, nonprofit organizations such mm -hmm. as um, settlement houses. We have school nurses. We have community outreach workers, people who work at Head Start. 
So it's a pretty diverse coalition of groups and individuals. And what is the need that you are seeking to address here in central Ohio? Well, that's a good question. In Ohio, there are around one and a quarter million people who are uninsured. In Franklin County, I think the most recent estimate was around 117 million people without health insurance. And although we have a great number of doctors in Columbus, in many neighborhoods in our city, people have great, a great deal of problem finding care, finding doctors, because the doctors are, are not in those neighborhoods. Oh, so what they would be um, more associated with hospitals or, or um, the doctor's offices that we see close to hospitals and things like that, not actually in the neighborhood itself. Correct, or located in more affluent neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So the people in the poorest neighborhoods have a lot of problems getting access to primary care. We have um, neighborhood health centers, many of which have long waiting lists for care and people don't know about the neighborhood health centers, but they can't begin to meet the need that's out there. People also have problems. People without ins health insurance or who have inadequate health insurance have a lot of problems getting prescriptions filled. They can't, pay, they can't afford to pay for prescriptions when prescriptions are written for them. People have trouble getting vision care, and especially dental care is a big problem here for people who can't afford to pay what dentists charge. So even though there may be some health clinics available, the waiting lists are very long to get into those clinics, and if someone uh, is experiencing a pretty serious illness or if a crisis comes up, they have limited options. Well, people who are in crisis can always go to an emergency room mm -hmm. for care, but we'd like to see people get preventative and regular mm -hmm. primary care so that they don't end up in emergency rooms. And one of the things that we'd like to do is to work with local hospitals on figuring out solutions to the problems that people have. Nonprofit hospitals have really been taking a beating in the last few years from managed care. Traditionally, nonprofit hospitals um, received enough money from paying patients mm -hmm. to provide community care to the community services and programs that we mm -hmm. call community benefits, and also to provide charity care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their funds have been drying up because managed care has reduced the revenues that hospitals are receiving. Also, the federal government um, has cut the, the reimbursements to hospitals for uninsured care. Nonetheless, the nonprofit hospitals, in exchange for the tax exemptions they mm -hmm. get and, and charitable contributions, have an, an obligation mm -hmm. to provide for community health needs. And we think that um, we would like members of the community, members of the neighborhoods who are suffering mm -hmm. these unmet health needs, to be able to sit down face to face with hospital officials and discuss solutions to those unmet health needs. So what you're saying is that if someone is experiencing some kind of a health crisis, they can always go to the emergency room. Right. But that's not optimal because prevention can go a long way towards um, preventing very high medical costs because you've Absolutely. nipped it in the bud or prevented it from the very beginning. Yes. And because hospitals are seeing um, less profit, they maybe don't have as much uh, as far as education or preventive programs that are actually reaching out into the community. And so you're trying to get people together to discuss how, how can we address these unmet health needs, how can we emphasize um, citizen education and prevention in health. Plus you also have concerns because uh, vision and dental aren't really being covered either. Right, and we're, we're in the process in our coalition of trying to figure out what are the most critical unmet health care needs to address aside from access to primary care, and we are starting to hold discussion groups all mm -hmm. around the city with people in the communities who may be having problems accessing health care. So you're actually going to some underserved communities and meeting, for example, with a settlement house exactly. or a Head community start parents. center, a Head exactly. Start parents, exactly. And, and getting input, we need yes. this or we need that, yes. and trying to devise a solution to that. Correct, and also encouraging participate, participants in those meetings to agree to come with us when we do have discussions with hospital groups. 
ah, I see what you're saying, so that it's a group of people going to the hospital and saying, we've identified these unmet community needs, how can we work together? Yes. Okay. And what are some possible solutions that your coalition has been discussing? Well, you know, we really haven't gotten far kind enough to talk about, about possible solutions. Um, other than in general, the, the neighborhood health centers, for instance, don't have the capacity now to meet the needs of the uninsured. Most of the uninsured are working people. Yes. And they need access to primary care evenings and weekends. The neighborhood health centers in the city do have some weekend, evening and weekend hours, but they need more funding in order to have more weekend and evening hours. So um, because a person has a job, but they might not have health insurance, it's still a real challenge for them to get the health care they need because it's not available at times when they're off work. Mm. They can't get Saturday appointments or things like that. That's right. Another problem is that the hospitals all provide free care under the um, what's known as the HCAP program in Ohio to people who are living at or below the poverty level. Unfortunately, people don't know that. And the HCAP program is supposed to be posted in, in hospital waiting rooms. We'd like to see the hospitals have better signage to let people know about what programs are available. Also, we'd like the hospitals to inform patients about um, any other um, benefit programs that they offer to patients, such as assistance in paying medical bills if they're not qualified to the HCAP program. And also, um, many people who live above the poverty level are still don't have the money to pay hospital bills. The neighborhood health centers and the children's hospital clinics have sliding fee scales so that people mm -hmm. who are above the poverty level can pay a reduced fee. We'd like to see our hospitals also develop sliding fee scales. Some of them have some sliding fee scales. We'd like to see the hospitals on a uniform basis develop sliding fee scales and then let the community know that those fee scales are available. Well, I've not heard of the HCAP program, so could you give a little bit more detail about this? This is... Under Ohio state law, mm -hmm. um, people who need hospital level care um, have their hospital bills paid for by the HCAP program if they're living at or below the poverty level. And that would mean, gee, 1998 um, for a family of three around thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars a year. Um, if people are interested in knowing more about the HCAP mm -hmm. program, they could call any one of the hospitals in the city and ask about the HCAP program to find out whether they're eligible for it. But you'd also like to see information about this program made more widely available so yes. that, that people know that this is in place and that they do have a safety net right. of some kind. Also, um, the HCAP program only pays for hospital care. It wouldn't pay for the surgeon if you needed an operation or the anesthesiologist or a lot of the other things that people see on hospital bills. And people, as I say, who are not eligible for HCAP who don't have health insurance, the uninsured working poor, end up paying more for their hospital bills than HMOs pay when they pay a hospital bill because HMOs and large insurance companies work out discounts with hospitals on oh, hospital charges. Okay. But an uninsured individual doesn't get that discount. We would hope that people would get those kinds of discounts and also be offered a sliding fee scale. So those um, some of the unmet needs then that you have discussed are the availability of doctors or health care clinics in neighborhoods where people might have limited transportation. Right. Um, you'd like more information available about the different programs like the HCAP program. What are some other things that you're working on um, as far as you said maybe some of the solutions weren't fully developed but you certainly were seeing a lot of unmet needs. Well there's something else that, that we probably should not go unmentioned and that is all the changes that have gone on in the health care marketplace. Um, I mentioned that the Coalition for Community Health Care got started when Doctors Hospital was going to sell to a for-profit giant Columbia mm -hmm. HCA and as um, we see our hospitals and health insurers changing hands uh, we think it's important that the community be able to preserve health care resources that exist. For instance, if a hospital in town were to sell to uh, or merge with a, with a larger 
hospital mm -hmm. or an, a, an out-of-state hospital chain, we would want to see guarantees in that sale that services that the communities count on will remain in existence. For instance, we wouldn't want a for-profit hospital company to buy a hospital and close one of the branches. I see. Um, or terminate services that people with disabilities need. And that was one of our concerns last year when Doctors Hospital was talking about selling, that Doctors Hospital does a lot of charity care and also provides a lot of services for people on Medicaid who have severe disabilities, who are on Medicaid because of their disabilities. We wouldn't want unprofitable services, mm -hmm. um, such as neonatal intensive care units, and burn units and services to disabled populations to be shut down because a for-profit company bought a hospital. So we, we're watching changes in the marketplace. We're also very concerned about um, the construction of for-profit um, outpatient surgery centers and what we're calling boutique hospitals that um, are being built in Columbus. A company from, a for-profit company from Tennessee is going to be building two maternity hospitals here in Columbus called Metasphere. And they are not planning, as far as we know, to offer any charity care. They're gonna provide maternity care to low-risk mm -hmm. insured patients. That's gonna take revenue away from our nonprofit hospitals. Our nonprofit hospitals use the revenue from those mm -hmm. low risk insured patients to provide care for high risk and uninsured patients. We don't want to see our nonprofit hospitals losing mm -hmm. valuable revenue that they use to meet our community's health needs. So these um, specialized maternity care hospitals, um, they're taking a very low risk approach as far as pretty healthy women who have the insurance to pay their costs right, exactly. and you're concerned that people will flock to those centers and not be going to um, say a St. Anne's or University who um, needs those revenues to offset the charity work that they do. Exactly and this is a trend we're seeing around Ohio because Ohio has phased out its certificate of need law which required hospitals to get um, per, a permit from the state before increasing building new facilities and um, we also don't have hospital licensure in the state of Ohio we're one of two states in the country so because of the absence of state legislation Ohio is becoming a testing ground for this kind of building and we worry very much about the abil future ability of our nonprofit hospitals to provide for the needs of our communities now you had mentioned when we were talking um, something about Medicaid, letting people know about el their eligibility or the availability of Medicaid. Could you just briefly clarify that? Sure. Um, while welfare reform has caused many people to move off of welfare and into jobs, most of which don't provide health insurance. And many people who've gone off cash assistance, most people who've gone off cash assistance have mm -hmm. also given up their Medicaid. Welfare reform delinked Medicaid from welfare so that people who have gone into jobs may still be eligible for Medicaid and their kids are very likely eligible. On January 2nd of 1998, Ohio raised the eligibility levels for children for Medicaid in their Healthy Start program. So children who are living in households with countable income up to 150 percent of poverty and that's all children up to the age of 19 mm -hmm. are eligible for the Medicaid Healthy Star program. That's a free program that gives compre comprehensive health care benefits, primary preventative care, vision, dental, everything a child needs to stay healthy. And yet we have many, many uninsured children in this state who are, and in this county who are eligible for this program and don't know about it and the county has developed an outreach program and we're participating in outreach efforts both in the counties in the county and around the state to make sure that kids get signed up for Medicaid and that their parents sign them up. That, that seems like that would be extremely critical. The health of our country and our state of course depends on the health of our children. And Absolutely and you know young children if they get proper screening and can be treated at a young age will be able to go to school and learn. Children oh, yes. who don't have access to health care 
may go to we know that children go to school with untreated health conditions such as hearing problems and they don't learn and they grow up to be a lot less productive adults than they could be if they got adequate health care. So Certainly. this is very important to the future well-being of our whole country. That's what I was thinking, that, that investing in our children's health is an investment in our future. Absolutely. And we would like to see this program expanded to their parents, many of whom don't have insurance. Three quarters of uninsured kids live in households with parents who don't have insurance. And while it's wonderful that we're expanding health care to kids, you can Ohio believes that their parents need health insurance too. Well, Kathy, I feel like I've learned a lot about unmet health needs here in Central Ohio and how you're working to devise solutions to that. I want to thank you for sharing this information. I mean, I think this is real basic, critical information that everybody in Central Ohio needs to know. So thanks a lot for educating me and hopefully our viewing public. Kathy Levine of Universal Healthcare Action Network of Ohio. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, this is Melissa Majors of Greater Columbus Community Shares. Welcome to Focus on Community and Focus on Community News, a look at some of the activities of our member agencies over the last month or so. But first, I'd like to announce some campaign results for the 1997 campaigns for Community Shares member agencies. Community Shares has raised over $130,000 in the fall of 97 workplace campaigns. This is more than double what was raised in 1996. Certainly, we want to thank the generosity of donors to Community Shares and our member agencies. The growth came particularly from our new workplace campaign at The Ohio State University with results of over $50,000. This increase in workplace campaigns for community shares and our local agencies reflects a national trend. The National Committee of Responsive, Responsive Philanthropy reports that since 1991, alternative funds have seen growth of 27% or $72 million nationally in workplace campaigns. We believe that this demonstrates not only the generosity of donors in the workplace, but their interest in supporting a wide range of issues, including agencies that work for social change, prevention, and citizen education. So again, thanks to all those wonderful donors here in Central Ohio supporting the work of Community Shares and our member agencies. The League of Women Voters of Metropolitan Columbus recently honored Dr. Bernadine Healy with the Democracy in Action 1998 Award. Dr. Healy is a cardiologist and dean of the College of Medicine and Public Health at The Ohio State University, as well as a medical consultant and commentator for CBS News, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Women's Health, a re researcher and author or co-author of more than 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts. She's a highly sought-after speaker who has a strong commitment to volunteerism in her community. We would also like to congratulate Dr. Bernadine Healy for her Democracy in Action Award. The Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio Re last week issued a press release announcing an agreement with Fifth Third Bank, the Ohio Community Revestment Project, and Cohio on a community development joint initiative. Fifth Third Bank has agreed to invest $1.25 billion in low interest and community development loans to revitalize communities throughout Ohio. Community Shares member, the Ohio Coalition on Community Development, was also involved in developing this agreement with Fifth Third Bank, which will provide more affordable housing and low-cost loans to many, many working Ohioans so that they can realize the American dream of a home of their own. Community 21 hosted the Spring Regional Conference for the Alliance for Community Media in Columbus, Ohio, May 7th through May 9th. 
cable access folks from Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and Kentucky gathered to attend such workshops as how to start an access center, dealing with controversial programming, changing into a community media center, designing a community computer center, and an issue about which I spoke, how community cable access and nonprofit organizations can work together to educate donors and the community about the many nonprofit services and programs available. Columbus civil rights attorney Benson Wollman gave the keynote speech at the community media conference on Friday, Conflicts of Values in the Media, Expression versus Equality. Other activities of the uh, conference included a party for the participants with music by the blues duo Beersdorf and Kolb of the Columbus Blues Alliance. Thanks a lot to Community 21 for hosting this spring regional conference for public access. Community Shares was a participant in the gatherings at the continent on May 21st. We want to thank the continent for their commitment to nonprofits in our local community. Every summer, the continent hosts Thursday night gatherings at the continent with live music, and the proceeds from these events go to local nonprofits who provide volunteers to work at the event. So again, thanks to the continent and the community shares volunteers. This is Melissa Majors, Executive Director of Greater Columbus Community Shares. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Focus on Community with our special guest, Kathy Levine of the Universal Healthcare Action Network. If you'd like to learn more about Community Shares or how we can be part of your workplace campaign, please feel free to give us a call at 299-3220. Thank you for joining us on Focus on Community. yourself in the Army National Guard, serving one weekend a month and two weeks a year, and you'll find an extra paycheck, money for college, and all the adventure you can handle. It's a great way to serve your country and community. Call 1-800-GO-GUARD. If you're ready to pass the test, you can. An American at your best, you can. Adventure helping service in the Army National Guard. In the Army National Guard. Can. Really the best part about foster parenting is the kids and uh, all the enjoyment and enrichment that they bring into our lives and to our own biological children. It's about the child feeling safe and if you can provide a warm safe environment for the child it doesn't matter that you're single. They will remember this forever even if they're only with you a short period of time they will remember the normal life that they had in your household. 